Okay, so well, let's, let's get started. Get started. Uh, and seeing as this is being broadcast to the world, um, I'll ask that people use the mic when we're, you're talking so that all the folks at home and the ships at sea and everything like that can see you and, and, and follow as we're going. What I'd like to do is to just start by introducing, have everyone introduce themselves, uh, give a little bit of a, a little bit of background of sort of where you are in this world uh, and sort of key questions that you may have that you want to sort of toss into our discussion over the next hour. So I'm Gary Van Lanningham. Uh, I direct the Pew MacArthur Results First Initiative, which is working with states and some local governments on evidence-based policymaking and modeling the impact of a broad range of social interventions. I'm Pamela Russo. I'm a senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I've been there since 2000. Um, before that, I was a doctor and epidemiologist. But for me, the whole modeling thing goes back to my undergraduate career in, in history and philosophy of science. And I love that Epstein article. Hi, everyone. I'm Paula Lance. I'm chair of the Department of Health Policy and Management at George Washington University. I am a demographer and epidemiologist by training, so a lot of my research over the years has been in, it's involved modeling uh, at the, because I like thinking about populations and what happens population level when policy levers are tweaked. Hi everybody, my name is Tiffany Huang. <laughs> I am at the National Association of County and City Health Officials, um, and I work in the areas of community health assessments and community health improvement planning, as well as um, some work with our public health transformation team, and some of what we're really interested in is modeling decision making for local health departments. I'm Julie Howell, Senior Health Policy Advisor for the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. I've been there about three years. Um, my background is strategic planning, so using modeling originally um, to help in hospital planning and seeing where there are major opportunities were to serve different groups of uh, patients. Then in DC, working um, first as a congressional staffer and then at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where we did lots and lots of modeling and hopefully making the results of those evaluations more readily available for the work that we've just been discussing to do better modeling with interventions is the area that I'm most interested in. I'm Bob Kaplan. I'm a member of the Roundtable, and uh, I am the Chief Science Officer at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. I've been there a little less than a year, and my job before that was the NIH NI Associate Director for the Behavioral and Social Sciences. And in that role, we sponsored a lot of the system science work. Before that, I was in academia for 36 years. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Duggan. I am a Partnership for Prevention, where I do communications and dissemination for the Community Health Advisor, uh, which Pamela mentioned before. It's a website that makes the results of microsimulation models available to communities. Uh, Steve Wolf, I uh, direct the Center on Society and Health at Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, our center uh, does work to raise awareness about the importance of social determinants of health and other factors outside of healthcare that shape health outcomes. Um, it involves a fair amount of outreach to policymakers at the national, state, and local level, um, as well as a significant amount of stakeholder and community engagement. But our research arm uh, is increasingly interested in the role of modeling uh, as a way of trying to inform decision makers um, and, uh, and capture the power of, of uh, increasingly interesting data sets that are available. Our early work used uh, traditional regression models to try to create online interactive tools to help policymakers play around with different social determinants and see what effect it has on health outcomes and costs. But increasingly now we're interested in uh, 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 harnessing the power of big data. And we're currently uh, starting a project in San Diego with Julie and Nick, who will introduce himself shortly, uh, to take advantage of uh, rich data sets available in San Diego County uh, as part of a large collective impact initiative. Mary Pittman, I'm president of the Public Health Institute in California. Happy to be here with some of my colleagues. Um, we do a lot of research and demonstration programs that are really focused on how to improve population health and have done that for many years. We have um, used a variety of methods but haven't really used formal models like Rethink Health or some of the other models that have been mentioned today but are very interested in seeing how they can be applied, particularly at the 
state government and local government level and the interaction between those different levels of government I think are important. Um, in my own background, when I was working on my doctorate at Berkeley, I worked on a simulation that was, I would say, a precursor to Rethink Health that David Starkweather had used to train um, healthcare administrators. And so, um, you know, 25 years ago, I was the, the person tweaking the different variables, but I found the power of uh, simulations for both educational tools, but also for doing planning and modeling. So um, I'm excited to see the field emerge. Hi, I'm Rajiv Bhatia. I'm a consultant with the Civic Engine. Um, I have, uh, uh, my work involves uh, uh, the sort of trying to ensure accountability of uh, uh, the social systems, uh, of other political institutions to the needs of health. Um, I worked at the San Francisco Health Department for 17 years where I developed the practice of health impact assessment and community indicators. Uh, we were, in the, in the context of that practice, we used uh, models to provide the information decision makers needed to change decisions. Uh, my current interest is um, uh, trying to get uh, health systems now to collect information on uh, basic human needs at an individual level. Um, both as business intelligence for the for those health systems and to generate the sort of policy and political information needed um, to make the investments in um, education, housing, food, and other social systems. Good morning. Paul Clintworth with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, affectionately known as ONC and uh, really here looking at the interoperability of health and non-health data systems in support of population health, but looking at how we can continue to drive some of those from a policy and standards perspective to help modeling and uh, researchers as we continue to uh, look uh, to the enablement of health IT. Good morning, I'm Nick Mascione, I'm the director for the County of San Diego Health and Human Service Agency. Uh, and the rapporteur or reporter, as uh, uh, Dr. Wolf would say, uh, for this group. Um, the last 18 years I've been with the Health and Human Service Agency, where 18 years ago we integrated uh, all the facets of health and human services to create uh, this super agency, integrated agency. Uh, and that was a model in and of itself, uh, trying to talk about the culture of health. Uh, and we could talk more about that. But more in the last uh, eight years, uh, we've been pursuing a wellness model uh, to have uh, better health and longer lives uh, as a, as a spin-off to the uh, poorer health and shorter lives uh, that we're comparing to. And we'll talk more about that and I'm very um, passionate about this concept of uh, the social enablers of health and the importance they play as we bring them together. Okay, what I'd like to do now is to sort of focus on what challenges we all see in using models to inform policy. Uh, and these challenges could come in a, in a variety of ways. I mean, there's evidence challenges of, of sort of building the model to, and having the information necessary to do the modeling. Uh, there are political challenges in distributing those this report, this, that information into the policy process. There's communication challenges of what's the best way of communicating pretty complex stuff to policymakers who aren't going to read a 400-page report and, and, and understand the brilliance of footnote 512. Uh, so, what, what challenge? Where do we think the field is now, and what are the problems that we really need to resolve to move forward? Uh, and. We can go around on that, or people can raise their hands. Uh, but let's just get a good discussion. Fortunately, we have two bikes now, so we can start working on this. I think one of the exciting things is the uh, open source data movement, and um, you know, government taking un unlocking data that was difficult to access before, making it more interoperable, and. Um, it, the use of GIS mapping, which makes that much more visible and accessible to people at a community level. I don't think that's enough, though. I think the making sense of it and facilitating the making sense of the maps is a really important uh, next step that is, I think, one of our gaps right now. I think uh, 
one of the challenges is uh, our ability to have a conversation across cultures. And so the policy making culture is, is, um, is the consumer uh, that, that needs this information. The researchers and modeling folks um, uh, are in a different space. And uh, it's not necessarily the case, in my experience, that the policymaker knows which kinds of questions uh, that are important to them are, are questions that are answered by models. Uh, as opposed to just looking it up somewhere in a, in a data table. Um, the researchers can differentiate between a question that uh, is simply a, a, a question about a time trend analysis uh, that doesn't require bringing in the kind of heavy lifting that we're talking about. So having a conversation, we're starting to experience this in our experiences at the start of our work in San Diego, having a conversation with stakeholders to try to understand what are the questions you need answered and what are what of those questions are the kinds of issues that would be helped by modeling? Uh, is is part of the educational process that has to happen in both directions. Um, so, from a from an information perspective, one of the the sort of the major obstacles that I've I've observed is the. Um, the information that we have on health and population health is generally at the individual level collected by health care systems. And we've defined health that way, which is a separate problem. Um, and the information we use, I think, for, uh, let's say, population health or public health uh, systems, decision-making analysis is, is um, generally even at a, a population level. Uh, and those two systems of information really aren't joined up. Um, I think the solution, a solution to that is, um, um, I mean, I think a, a, a joined up health uh, uh, and social system could be collecting the educational, um, employment, uh, income, uh, and other um, sort of core needs uh, of, of the same person who has uh, uh, a set of sort of health parameters. But that doesn't really exist uh, at, at scale now. Um, I guess at a, and I, I'll, I'll keep sort of political sort of issues aside, but just from a very practical basis, our institutions are structured so um, um, the information we might produce from robust population health modeling isn't relevant to um, it isn't relevant to uh, systems that have the ability to change uh, parameters. So um, the a, a planner in a planning department is responsible for producing a certain number of units of housing uh, throughput of getting permits uh, through but not the the health consequences of housing the health system a public health safety net system is, is sort of caring for that um, uh, in, a, in a different in a sort of a different institution but you know fundamentally you don't the in, um, um, you can talk to a healthcare system, and they would, uh, uh, they might, uh, their interest in collecting sort of the educational or, or uh, uh, income or other determinants of health is limited because of their ability to see that as sort of actionable or within the uh, mandate. So we don't, we, I think that's a really a fundamental barrier for the utility. So I. One of the things that uh, I think we have an opportunity moving forward now is patient-generated health data and the incorporation of that into modeling, especially when we're looking at social determinants of health. So I want to make sure that we kind of keep that in the back of our brains because that data can, that data can also be very robust and certainly uh, be a time series for individual patients aggregated up to a population or a community level. One of my concerns is in how we can improve the science of modeling. And I think one of the major challenges is that we have lots of colleagues who just don't believe the results of, of modeling exercises, primarily because that these exercises are subject to all kinds of biases. So for example, with big data, instead of having a pre-specified outcome variable, you have hundreds of variables to choose from, almost assuring that in any analysis some outcomes will be statistically significant. So as we go forward, which we certainly are, I think that we need to continue to think about um, how we can validate the models and cross-validate them across you know, different circumstances. Lots to talk about on this topic, but one thing I'll throw out is a, I think it's a challenge that's both kind of a methodological challenge, but also one in terms of dealing with policymakers. It's 
been mentioned this morning that it's it's best when presenting modeling results to policymakers that you present options if we did because they'd like to think they're comparing and contrasting their their options but a challenge with the sophistication of our modeling techniques right now is they're not really good about looking at synergies or interactions. So and I do a lot of work in tobacco. It's not, it's not like we're gonna just do this tobacco control policy versus this one. We do them together and there are synergies and they, they build on each other and it, it makes it very complex to model, but that's exactly what a policymaker is gonna want to know. I think one of the barriers sometimes comes in with just because of inertia and an infrastructure that's been built and a reimbursement that's been built. And the example that I'm thinking of is the way that CDC tracks um, food safety data. They track it by organism. So we had funded a, a group that was doing something rather different, which is what you really want to know is what's the food organism pair if you're going to be intervening and doing the right type of regulation and investigation. So they, you know, they build a, a lovely model input from, you know, grocery association, all of these different types of stakeholders. It was very hard for CDC to shift their thinking from, you know, being able to say that the, the, the major <coughs> contaminant is, you know, salmonella, to thinking about what's the food source pair. And so it was, it wasn't, that they critiqued the model. It was their whole paradigm about how could our information here actually change what we do. Yeah, I, mean, I think about the, it's in that there's, there, there's several challenges, some of which reflect where we are as a field, and some of them are, are probably just things we're always going to have to deal with. Uh, from our perspective, there, there's real gaps in, in the research uh, that I talked about. There's also questions on to what extent can research be extrapolated to diverse populations if it's based on one population? You know, pr probably we know that smoking is not good for anybody, but would a cognitive behavioral therapy program be equally effective in you know, a high SES Anglo community versus a low SES you know, Hispanic community or, or a, uh, another set of, of population? Uh, and I don't know how we're going to get around that until we end up with ability of doing, you know, rapid low-cost RCTs all over the world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think that there's challenges just for where the field is now, that there are, are many different modeling approaches, and a, a, as you said, uh, the danger with that is the people who already have sort of a anti-science perspective will quickly get the idea that your model can give me any answer I want, depending on what you do with it, so why should I listen to anybody's model? Um, and you know, at some point, it would be good to have more standards on models, but whether we're ready to do that yet as a field is, I think, always going to be open for question. But I don't think we, have, we can live with a situation where you know, your model gives an ROA, ROI of $1, and mine gives $15, because there's just so much divergence in, in the approach that, you know, we need to start moving towards a little bit more standardization. Painful as that will probably be. I, I think that there are challenges in the types of answers that we can produce and what policymakers ideally would want. And I think that is probably always going to be implied. But just, it gets, even gets into the model, the technical model development of how we display the results. Uh, because unfortunately, policymakers watch movies, so they think that they're going to be able to, like, come up with something and they're going to be able to go into a wall and just move stuff around and, you know, zoom in on one client and see the impact on them, which, you know, we, none of us recognize that that is probably real anytime soon, but that's sort of how, what's the best way of portraying the results that we can in something that doesn't go beyond the data we have, but really makes it as real as possible to the policy makers. And then the, the ongoing gap of how do we bring this information into the policy process, uh, recognizing that we love all the nuance behind it. Policy makers deal very much in black and white world. Uh, do I fund this or not? not yeah, well, I'll fund it a little bit because that doesn't really mean anything. So that there's communication challenges that we all face, and I think that's implicit. But I think you know, the question is, what can we work on to try to move the field forward uh, to make modeling more real and, and more useful to, to policy? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add a cha another challenge, and that's the, the profession's cultural challenge, I see it. And that's the fidelity to the professions. So I teach at the Graduate School of Public Health in San Diego uh, for the last almost uh, two decades. And even in the School of Public Health, um, 
we will take a sociology course as a core course, and they won't hear about the, the social enablers of health for the most part for the rest of their training. Um, I don't think they're alone in that. Um, and so you have the different specialties, same in medical school, same in schools of social work, same in nursing programs. And yet, when they come out in the professions now, uh, we think we got these global thinkers and enablers and bring all this together when, in fact, they have their biases, they have their fidelity to their professions, and we're saying, no, now it's a new game here. We're really looking at population health. And so I have a large workforce, 6,000 employees, and trying to get them to think as an agency of one um, is I realize I have a whole family of different professions coming. And so the whole talking to the culture of the workforce and organizations is a huge challenge because you won't even get to the effect that everyone will have their different models from social work to sociology to medicine to public health. But if they're not open-minded uh, to more about the community well-being and wellness, and that's why we talk about wellness, because uh, it's not about health care or, or health even. It goes beyond. It's about the issue of safety, economic well-being, and so forth. So that, I just want to put that on there. That's another challenge for us that uh, the education sector, uh, graduate education in particular, has to be a major part of what we're talking about. I want to go back to uh, two comments. One, Rajiv's about the siloing of the way we address issues and the way we collect and look at data. Um, the roundtable, you know, we've sat through many different sessions where we've looked at education, we've looked at um, equity and disparities, we've looked at, you know, a whole, uh, income, a whole variety of topics. And we also had a presentation on health and all policies. And I want to take us back to that tool because I think it's a very useful tool that kind of forces you to look across and, and one can quibble with the term having to look at health and all policies, put whatever in a multi-policy form. I think the discipline of trying to look at it from the various lenses and putting the infrastructure together where that happens and then looking at how the data cuts across or what are essential data elements that you need across different disciplines so that you can effectively analyze what the outcome is that you're seeking um, is something that we have the tools, we just haven't applied them, I don't think, as extensively as we might, although I'm, I'm really excited about some of the work that's been going on at, at the local level in California. Some local governments really are starting to use it as well as the state government. I'm sure, Julie, you have something to add to that. I think another thing that Paul said is make sure we're talking about patient-generated health data. I was just at the Climate and Health Summit at the White House on Tuesday, and it was very interesting because people from um, Microsoft and Google were talking about how they're collecting data and they're using it to be able to explicate the impact of climate on health. Well, we have many other non-health, non uh, social service providers who are collecting really important information and are aggregating that uh, data, and they're going to be game changers. So I think we have to step out of our professional box of public health and health care and health policy to say, what are the questions that need to be answered and who has the data? And it's going to come from some unlikely suspects. Yeah. To, is this on? Yes. To build on that, I think the benefit of looking locally at, because the question is, which policymakers and where do you actually have the opportunity to look across sectors? So a benefit, say, in San Diego, you've got SANDAG, which is the regional planning agency. Um, thanks to um, funding through ARA, CDC, with the original communities putting prevention to work, in San Diego, with SANDAG, we actually created the first public health subcommittee of um, SANDAG, and it's been doing health impact assessments and really beginning to take that bigger view. So you can start saying, well, if I'm going to do transportation planning, where should I put um, the, the stop, and how is that going to impact the housing around it? Uh, the, you know, so 
you've got to search for the, those places where it's possible to take the cross-sectional view and anticipate what that will be so that you've got some modeling to um, assist the decisions that are going to arise. Um, just one comment I want to make, something that I struggle with pretty much daily is, is timing, both in the terms of developing the models and then also bringing results to communities. Um, you know, communities don't want to necessarily see impact over their years. They want to see it in five years. Um, and, you know, they want a quick and dirty model, whereas the modelers I work with, you know, there's, there's no such thing as a quick and dirty model. So, you know, how do we, how do we, <laughs> how do we bridge that gap? I wanted to build off the, uh, the silo comment and, and maybe, you know, return to our social determinants theme a bit to say that, um, I, I, it's like the blind man feeling the elephant. Uh, depending on what perspective and what, which specialty you're dealing with, uh, there are different ideas about the social determinants that matter most. So yesterday, for example, I was in a meeting where um, uh, the colleague was basically saying, yeah, poverty's important, education's important, but doesn't it really all come down to residential segregation? Uh, and then you'll have other people that'll say it's income inequality or it's uh, macrostructural policy decisions. Um, Steve Toich put up at the beginning this morning the county health rankings conceptual model uh, for the determinants of health. There's the WHO determinants of model. They all are, uh, are theories about what's upstream, what's downstream, and, and, and assumptions about root causes. But I think uh, both for policy makers' perspectives uh, in terms of identifying where they're going to get the most bang for the buck and also for the the scientific agenda, there's a real opportunity for modeling and multi-level modeling and other strategies to try to replace those assumptions with some kind of empirical evidence uh, to begin to tease out what, what really is a root cause to deal with those interaction effects. And, and that, I think, sets the stage for a complex systems modeling that I think you know, is, is where we need to be. So this also returns to the kind of the social determinants, education discrimination theme of the, the session. Um, now, now, by the way, I, I owe this to, to Steve and Paula. Um, over the course of the last couple of years, I've been really taken with the impact of educational attainment on life expectancy. And that you know, we did it in the round table, we did a whole session on this in June. And the more I've gotten into it, the more persuaded I've been that this is, this is a crucial thing. So for example, if you look at, um, people with untreated high blood pressure or cholesterol from you know, the era when epidemiologic studies were done when people weren't treated. You know, if, if you take someone with, with uh, uncontrolled blood pressure and you control it, you give them about six months of life expectancy, or eight months, and, and cholesterol is maybe six months, where the difference in life expectancy between someone with less than high school graduation, uh, high school education versus a graduate degree is maybe 10 to 12 years, and so the order of magnitude is much larger. But we get hung up because that, um, you know, as Steve pointed out, that the difference in life expectancy for treatment of risk factors is based on RCTs and that we don't know handing a high school degree to someone is not going to make them live longer. We don't really understand that. And when I've gone around and give, given talks about this, I always get this pushback, particularly the NIH, where people would say, yeah, 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 there's a correlation. We don't have the scientific evidence to justify this. And just one more comment on this. When I was in California, um, when the state of California got into trouble, uh, they wanted to preserve the Medicaid program, or Medi-Cal in California. The opportunity cost actually was to take bigger slices out of the education budget. And that if you really look at, uh, you know, if you're trying to produce quality just life expectancy, you might have looked at it differently. But uh, and as, as Nick points out, that um, healthcare providers provide healthcare. They don't see this as part of their responsibility. They may be under, under um, affordable care uh, and uh, ACOs and so forth, this will change. Communities are decisions. For example, in Spokane, Washington, they had a, a big you know, community health collaborative. That collaborative decided that the thing that would improve the health of, of Spokane as well as the vitality of the community was a high school education. So they integrated evidence-based, you know, multi-pronged, things you know, from, from birth on up 
to move up their high school graduation rate. And, but they, that was a community decision that that was a more fundamental way for them to approach out. National studies, you know, countries that have invested in increasing high school graduation or college graduation rates, for example, actually do a generation later, they appear to experience big boosts in life expectancy. You know, South Korea being the best example, but there's there is a correlation across uh, across countries. But it's, it's I found this to be something where at a certain level, colleagues say, yeah, yeah, we understand this. But to get to that next level where they say, we, we really believe that this is true, it's been a bit of harder sell. Uh, to, to me, how we deal with some of these issues of, of how do you bring those interplays to, together is we have to build them into models. Because I think it's one thing to be able to tell a policymaker, oh, you know, research shows this is, is that, and, and it just sort of floats away. But if you can build that into a model and say, yeah, and we can show you how this happens. So if you cut the educational spending, Here's what's going to happen to you in five years. Uh, that I think changes the conversation. Now that there aren't data points on that yet, but I think it probably is the best opportunity we have to try to you know, change thinking. So to, to build on both of these points, you know, Bob Putnam's most recent book about our kids mm -hmm. and his analysis on what's happening in the community he grew up in versus now. I can reinforce that. Yeah. having grown up in New Orleans, seeing what it looked like when I grew up and what it's now. Um, somehow highlighting what these discrepancies are and how the way resegregation has happened based on SES, basically. So you've got all the factors at the local community level that are working against uh, achieving the outcomes that we really most need to achieve. And how you really build that in. Um, could be could make a huge difference, hopefully. And let me just throw an idea out. Yeah, one of the things that, that I've been thinking about is, in order to build the models that really answer the questions and show the interplay of all this stuff, it, it's a massive undertaking because you, you've got to build you know, a huge amount of research in there. You got to be able to show that the, the dynamism between this and then you've got to keep it up as the, the research goes. And right now we've got lots of little pockets of, of modeling that, that go out there. Uh, and I worry that what happens to those little models, which are really cool, when they're funding wise, you know, do we just sort of lose that? Um, and should we kind of come up with like an open source platform idea where you know, people who are working on transportation can contribute a transportation model to this big meta model that, that everybody can then use. Uh, because at some point, if we're gonna be building these, these models, we have to deal with the sustainability issue. And it's also, how do we make sure that this captures it? Because I'm not sure that one, any one entity can support that. But then I also worry that, you know, I, I think that worked really well for Wikipedia. Um, I don't think that Linux took over Microsoft as everybody sort of thought it would <laughs> a few years ago. Uh, so how do, we, how do we maintain and sustain that? If you look at, Yeah, yeah. The, 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 well, what, what would hope? <laughs> yeah, but, but you know, I, I think the future of this is either going to be everybody keeps chasing the foundations to, to do what we're doing now, or, or two, you end up with this open system, or three, you end up with like Google building this and selling it to everybody. Um, but but I, both because people do subscription for Remy and Implant and things like that. But but I think that's something we, we sort of need to start thinking about as a field of. Given the complexity of the models that we think are going to be necessary to answer the complex questions, how do we build those models? How do we sustain them long term? I think it's something that we should need to start a some conversation with. But then they, um, but then they also do things, you know, like on early childhood education and STEM teaching. And it's, it's, it's it, but it's very black because it's a proprietary thing. It, uh, yeah, I think I think an important question we have to answer, particularly for this uh, uh, group on social and economic conditions, is 
um, you know, where, where's the friction? Where's the pain that, you know, what, does, what problem is modeling going to solve or not? And is, is modeling going to solve, is that where, really where the pain point is? I think no one around this table would disagree on the, um, the evidence around income and education on health that it's uh, pervasive, it's multi-objective, there's, you know, that, um, that it operates across a life course, it's not particularly amenable to modeling, um, you know, uh, well, but is still very sort of uh, uh, convincing. Um, is the barrier to um, adopting that set of sort of decisions or policies that would make a healthier country really the lack of model? And, and I think, I mean, I think we have to answer, I think we have to be honest about, uh, about that. And if it is, uh, or what kind of modeling um, um, is, uh, you know, uh, necessary. I mean, we, what, it, what, um, what about modeling the lack, you know, is there a model of the lack of foresight of decision makers? I don't know. I mean, it, um, they, I mean, it, 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 not, uh, I mean, no, not, uh, so, yeah, I think that's one kind of sort of, you know, sort of, I think, question. And, uh, and, and models can, you know, or, in, you know, whatever information technology we want to bring has to uh, move in that direction. I think, uh, you know, I think what I observed from listening to your presentation, Gary, is that you're, um, you're meeting the decision makers where they're at, right? And I think that's very, you're meeting them with their sort of cultural assumptions and what their, you know, their needs for information. Um, and it's not and it's uh, not perfect, but it's sort of in, in incrementally kind of uh, making sort of uh, uh, progress. I, I heard the, this sort of the fragment, you know, the sort of the um, fragmentation of responsibility that I've observed between institutions. Nick, you mentioned really in, in terms of within the staff of your own institution, there's a fragmented sense of purpose and responsibility. Um, so I think that, that what is it um, I mean, I think even before the modeling, what is it, what is the, um, I don't know, our, you know, the, the way we're going to look at the world and the way we're going to measure the world that we can share in common uh, across sectors and then can we, you know, then can our information tools help um, sort of stimulate? So I, I have a proposal that, um, that it seems to me that part of the problem is that it's pretty confusing when we look at models and look at results and we're not all experts and that there may be some to use the word models that, that would be helpful. One of them is um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which I've become much more familiar with since I've come to art, has, has a really um, well-developed process that's been worked out over the course of Actually, Steve wrote the article on the process of the process <laughs> work, but, uh, but having watched the task force, they've been, been continually impressed with how they take complicated, um, complicated arrays of data and they work it through as, as a group and make recommendations. And what's really interesting about the Affordable Care Act is now for the first time the task force really has, has team because if they rate something as an A or a B, then it's covered under the Affordable Care Act without that. I'm wondering if something like the IOM or some other trusted body could form a group that, that is, applies the most rigorous scientific standards, defines a process that will allow us to interpret whether or not results from modeling are to be trusted. So I um, just finished a project funded by, um, from PCORI looking at what does the average American understand about the Preventive Services Task Force and sort of where this thing called guidelines comes from. And, but we, we also really looked into what, what do Americans think about the role of science and evidence in rec, you know, recommendations for, and this was around this type of healthcare called Preventive Services. We have a paper under review right, right now, but some of our findings very descriptive are, you know, 7% of the U.S. population has heard of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. Any? Okay, all right. But but probing down more, I mean, there is, there is this, and you know, there's a lack of trust um, from researchers, and especially sort of this. We found this interaction between the government putting out, interpreting science, and then telling people what they should do based on that across SES groups and racial groups and age groups, there's just not, there was not a lot of, a lot of trust 
in that. So yeah, we ex we explain and, and, and I won't belabor this, but we actually in the second part of our project we did some online experiments where we randomly assign different ways of talking about the Preventive Services Task Force and, and some controversial guidelines um, like PSA screening and didn't, mammography, that train has left the station. So, mm -hmm. But the change in cervical cancer screening guidelines and depending on the way you talk about this task force and how they come to their decisions, does that impact the way that people, whether or not they might follow the guidelines? And there are some nuances to that. You know, <clears throat> One of the challenges, uh, Bob, you triggered for me, I was thinking about, and it was context of this morning, is that in the health field, we're a lot more mature. And I think we would probably think we're still in our infancy around the whole open data, big data movement. But we're woefully behind, even in the human services side. And I was thinking um, the model that we're using for our population health modeling had some challenges for me because I was thinking the practice community is laying out the problem or the challenge, and then uh, the research community and the modeling community comes in to try to address that, and then you need that translator to take that to back to the practice, the community, to explain what it is they found, and then you need the translator again to take from the practice community to the policymakers. But you need a translator from the policymakers to the general public. And those steps are very challenging in and of themselves, but that assumes you have the type of competencies and skills in the translators that can translate the health community and can translate the human services community. And there I see a lot of gaps. Um, and I'm not sure where those are being addressed, because if you don't really address that, you can have terrific modeling terrific research, which I think we have. And you can have wonderful evidence-based policy making, but that translation can really trip you up. So, I think you have to start with the community at the front end, not wait until it's at the policy and it's being translated from policy back to the community. I think if you start with the community engagement at the front end and the defining of the question and making sense of what the data is showing that you're gonna pull that stream through and not have as much of a problem at the translation at the end. So uh, to build on that. Okay, so I was going to suggest building a bit on that. The collective impact model that comes out of Stanford, I've seen, I think is an important place to start because who you have at the table having the conversation carefully selected um, across the various sectors so you really can think about and you get different perspectives in setting up the conversation from the beginning. I'm a strategic planner and I can tell you from many different environments that makes a huge difference and the interaction among people will really give you insights that you won't get any other way. And it happens at several different levels so um, you need people of influence, but then you also need the voice of the community, and you need a process to make that happen so that you're going both directions. It's the steps of the HIA. So for example, NAS put out a uh, book about health impact assessment, uh, which he was on that. And you know, the, the, the initial thing, and you could say it better than I can, Rajiv, it is about having the multiple stakeholders in the room, it's doing the scoping, just a, it's science serving the political process and um, and I think it's like it's getting the information you can get just in time in the time you have uh, as good as you can and that tends to be I mean the decision makers uh, tend they're not going to spend a second discussing half the you know things about the model they don't really yeah they don't they don't really so care they, they just want the kind of the, uh, results um, I now forgot I think the, um, I'm going to ask. Unfortunately, modeling has shown that people will think bigger thoughts 
we have food uh, <laughs> in front of them. So we, we are running up against our time limit. I would encourage people to continue these conversations over lunch. Uh, these are big, important questions. I think groups like this having the discussion is what's going to be needed to move the field forward. Uh, I, I think we've made tremendous progress over the last few years in building these models and getting them into the policy process. We, we all, because we're all the true believers, see that so much more could be done and needs to be done. Uh, and hopefully this group and all the other groups will come up with the answers and chart the path forward for all of us. So thank you and let's go grab some lunch.